So I'm Beverly Rubick. I'm a biophysicist by training. And I'm actually much more well known for studies on the human energy field and on energy medicine. And those studies led me to take a look at water, the water in life, and to ask the question, uh, what should we drink? What really is the optimum water? Is there a fountain of youth that we can uh, rejuvenate, <laughs> become more resilient, etc.? Uh, so this talk is uh, slanted toward that topic in particular, and it's not my main research, but, uh, but it's certainly an important topic regarding life because uh, we're on the water planet, life requires water, it's the common element, it's really the matrix of life. Now, how does this thing work? Let's see. It's supposed to go forward, but it ain't. Hmm. Now I've got a problem. They tell me to press these things. Ah, it's a little backwards. Okay. So water is essential to life, but it's been largely ignored, especially in science. Everybody looks at the biomolecules. The last 60 years, the unraveling of DNA, the proteins, the carbohydrates, the fats in great detail, the pathways, the genome, etc. But the fact remains that 99% of the molecules of life are water in our bodies. And yet science has been preoccupied with the 1%. There is a new water science. If you heard Gerald Pollack the other day, you learned a little bit about that. And he has elucidated evidence for a fourth phase of water, which is really remarkable. And there's more to that science. I think not only is there a fourth phase, but I would say there are many minor structural variations in liquid water that enable water to hold information, information vital to life, energy and information. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. I see water as a complex dynamical substance forever sensing its environment and responding accordingly, just like a living system. So many of the properties that Gerald Pollack talked about in his talk, uh, explaining some properties of life in terms of water, um, I would extend to even more subtle realms. So the new science of water sees water as an active participant in life, not just a passive solvent holding together the biomolecules. That's what's new. And the human body is mostly water. Here we have the breakdown of the water content of cells in general, the kidneys, 83%. Uh, body fat has the least water, but still there's some water there, 10%. Water and fat don't mix very well. And even bone has water, 22%. And some tissues like brain are, are really high in water. So it's... Um, the major component. Water has many functions in the body, regulating body temperature, transporting nutrients, etc., circulation with the blood, moisturizing uh, the air in our lungs. Uh, it is involved highly with many biochemical reactions. If you look at them, you'll see the splitting of water, the formation of water. It's essential uh, in, in every way. So, um, and we start out much like this, very supple and full of water, and we gravitate toward this in old age. So it's been found that the greatest change in aging is loss of water. We start out 85% as young babies. By the time we're 65 years old, we're, we've dropped some 20% or more of intracellular water. That's a profound change. And yet everybody's looking at modifications of DNA or telomeres or cross-linking of collagen as, as uh, aging effects when it's this loss of water. How can we restore this? How can we prevent this loss of water? Those are some questions that I've asked. And what do we drink? Well, lots of people today are drinking bottled water. Of course, there's plasticizers in there and uh, the regulators don't um, tell us that they require anything special about bottled water except that it'd be just as good as tap water in terms of safe and, pet, you know, uh, microbial free, etc. Ideally, we would drink mountain streams, water flowing. We would drink well waters. And 
most of us at best are drinking mineralized alkaline water, uh, sometimes in bottles. Uh, and the richest water, uh, the healthiest water, is rich in electrons. If we were to measure the water flowing on the earth in streams at the site, not in a bottle like this, but I'm doing this because it's all I can get here. Here's Evian mountain water. <laughs> Uh, if we could measure it at the site, bring our instruments to the site of a stream and measure it, we would measure uh, a rich an electron stream. In other words, a very high negative oxidative reductive potential. So that it could be an electron donor. In other words, a very profound antioxidant. But we're drinking water from the tap. We're drinking beverages, water, etc., from bottles. And what do they have? They have a high positive oxidative reductive potential, just the opposite. So um, that's problematic because we've been doing it for life. Here's a physician that I met years ago. He's no longer on this plane, Dr. Bat Manjali, lived in New York, and he treated chronic disease with water. And he said that much of chronic disease could be assisted by drinking more water. People are not drinking enough water. As we age too, we lose our sense for thirst. Uh, so in other words, we may really crave, need water, but we're not thirsty enough to take enough water in, and that's problematic. That book is still being sold. And hydration is especially important for energy medicine. If any of you are acupuncturists or energy healers or using energetic therapies of any type, they're not working as well unless someone is well hydrated. So it's very important to drink water along with those practices. It's essential for the energy flow in the body. I have measured the electricity at the acupuncture points and meridians. And I can tell you this, when someone is not well hydrated, the electricity in the body is low. That's clear. And give them a glass of water and wait 20 minutes, which is about the absorption time of water in the stomach, and presto, the energy comes way up. Uh, so the whole acupuncture system of meridians and points, the conductivity of that depends on your hydration level. So today we have a lot of concerns about drinking water quality. As a child, I grew up in the Chicago area. We had the Great Lakes, which we could, uh, I don't think were even chlorinated much in, in my time growing up there. And now all of these waters have become unpalatable. I'm practically gagging on the water at lunchtime. I don't know about you. Yeah. So much great attention paid to organic food and fresh and local, and then the water is pathetic. Pardon me, but that's so. I have to say so. And I did find some filtered water in the, um, the um, exercise facility that at least doesn't have that chlorine edge. So I've been going in there to get a glass of water all day. So water is treated with chlorine, but worse, it's treated with chloramine, and you can't boil that off, and it kills fish. We have a group in the San Francisco Bay Area, people against chloramine, people who've got respiratory uh, symptoms from drinking chloramine-treated water, and they can't boil it off. Well, you can filter it off, fortunately, with carbon block or uh, carbon granules. But uh, fluoride is another thing. Uh, sold to us as something to build teeth and retain enamel on your teeth, etc. but it's a metabolic poison. It may have something to do with building enamel in teeth when you're young and then it's useless for adults. It's a metabolic poison. It also calcifies the pineal gland. And it's rather difficult to filter because it's a very tiny ion. It requires a special filter. It is not removed by carbon granules or carbon block. And most of us are reaching out for uh, uh, bottled water which have plasticizers. Um, and that's unfortunate because these plasticizers, and if you look at the bottom of a water bottle, most of them are rather transparent like this bottle, and then you see a number one on most of them because it, it is marketable to see clear plastic and it looks like clean water. Uh, actually, it's the worst plastic, number one. Uh, you're better off buying it in polyethylene jugs that are not transparent. That, water, that plastic is safer than this kind of plastic, which is leaching plasticizers into your drinking water. And you don't know the history of this. OK, it came from Evian, the French Alps. And then it traveled in a truck, maybe got heated up uh, on a ship or something. We have no idea of its history and whether it's still pristine and clean and, and not full of plastic 
uh, among other things, bottling plant chemicals, etc. Uh, so um, it's also stagnant. Would you eat canned food? Canned food doesn't have a lot of vitality. We should be measuring that soon with that device compared to fresh food. That will be interesting. But we're drinking bottled water. It's like it's stagnant. Water was meant to move. Water is always moving in nature. If it's not, it's stagnant and it's, it's not healthy. So functional drinking water, what do I mean by that? Well, we have the notion of functional foods. Um, there have been studies now on certain dietary supplements and on certain foods they can say heart healthy. I think on oatmeal they'll say things like that may lower cholesterol or something. Uh, specific health effects from specific foods or dietary supplements where the FDA now allows a statement that uh, this does this and you can put that on a label. It does a lot more but you know you're not allowed to say it all. <laughs> it has to have some, some, uh, some studies behind it. So when I talk about functional drinking water, I'm talking about structured water that uh, has some health effects on the body that go beyond just hydration, just drinking uh, water. And um, so water treated with electromagnetic fields may become functional water or structured water. Water treated with magnetic fields or vortexing. People are selling vortexers or putting water through spiral paths. And water is changed by this movement, especially in, uh, and water craves to move in spiral paths. Look at the paths of rivers and waterways uh, on Google Earth satellite images and you, you see that. Look at the circulatory system in the body, uh, the back of the retina, for example, in, during imaging, and you always see the, the water never moves in a straight line. And yet, we put up aqueducts, like in California, to irrigate with water moving in straight lines, even though 60 years ago or more, uh, Schauberger in Austria showed us that water moving in curves uh, is its true nature and can do remarkable things out there in the world, moving logs, etc. So there are a number of products in the marketplace, so-called structured waters. Uh, most of them are bottled waters. And to me, that doesn't make sense because water is always taking on a new impression depending upon where this bottle's been, what fields it's been exposed to. I had once a young man, he brought me water blessed by his guru in India. And I said, but you've been on a long airplane trip between here and there. And guess what? We didn't find anything <laughs> in, energetically about that water because those airplane engines and that uh, information of being in the sky was now imprinted on the water. Whatever his guru did to the water, that was long ago. So there is a memory to water. And I'll say a little bit about that at the end. Um, a memory and, and an impression of its surroundings of um, let me give you an example. Even um, snow falling at a certain, let's say, altitude has a certain crystal structure and then you were to take that melt and bring it to another uh, altitude and freeze it and it will retain a memory of the snowflake configuration that it had at the previous altitude, at least for a little while, till you go through another freeze-thaw. That's the kind of amazing memory of water that we have seen scientifically. Uh, and there, is, there was the work by Emoto, I'll just say parenthetically, that a lot of it was cherry picking, unfortunately, but it raised a lot of consciousness that you could imbue water with intent uh, or emotions such as love or hate, and that it might change crystallization patterns. And I've seen some of that in better studies that are uh, sham controlled and not cherry picked uh, pretty crystals that match love. So, <laughs> so my question here today, is there scientific evidence for functional water? And I'm going to bring you evidence for one of the best studied uh, functional or structured waters, and I've been drinking it also for a long time, and think it has uh, a lot of healthful effects. And I've experienced that personally as well as uh, from peer-reviewed studies in the literature. So I'm going to talk about water from ionizers. First, I'm going to talk about drinking water largely, and then I also have a section on water use in agriculture and um, other uses. So we're talking about a device, it's called an ionizer, and I'll show you what that looks like on the inside. <laughs> but water exposed to a, a strong electric field will break into its component parts, hydrogen and oxygen. Now we're not taking it that far, we're doing what's called partial electrolysis. 
So we're breaking up water and we're taking water from the cathode, the electron-rich cathode of a cell, and then water from the anode. And water from the cathode is rich in electrons, it's rich in the cations, uh, such as calcium and magnesium that were there in the starting water. And it's, um, the water from the anode is rich in anions. So those are the negative ions, uh, such as sulfate, nitrate, chloride, etc. So we're talking about the cathode fraction, which is also alkaline. Uh, so the counter ion to uh, calcium, uh, magnesium, etc., is the OH, um, the hydroxide ion. Now, this has been going on for a long time, the notion of partial electrolyzed water and its properties. Back in the 1930s, the Russians were exploring this, and most of the ionizers today are not made in the United States. Well, hardly anything is made in the United States, <laughs> sad to say, but uh, made in Japan, made in Taiwan, mainland China. I've lectured a lot in Japan on health topics, and I've asked the audience how many have an, an ionizer. And it's like 80% of the audience. And how many of you are drinking ionized water? I'd like to see a show of hands. Okay, there's about three, four, five in this room. That's great. That's really a high number, by the way, in the United States. This water is not well known here. And it goes by various names. I'm here calling it ionized alkaline water or alkaline ionized water. It's also called reduced water uh, as opposed to oxidized water. Uh, it's been reduced. It has electrons and it has the capacity to donate electrons. So it's, it's a rich antioxidant. Uh, electrolyzed alkaline water is another name, and uh, for simplicity, alkaline ionized water. I'll try to stick to that term here, but I may slip into the others. So, so here's a schematic of electrolysis. Um, it's a battery. It operates on DC. Of course, you're converting AC to DC. This is sort of the internal compartments after a pre-filtration of the water, where you would, would remove chloramine, chlorine, uh, fluoride, even if you had a fluoride filter. And then you've got pretty pure starting water, and then you conduct uh, standard electrolysis. This is textbook stuff. And you're taking water off the cathode. So what's in there? It retains the minerals that were present in the starting water, the calcium, magnesium, if there's sodium, potassium, that too. And uh, there will be a low level of hydrogen bubbles, and there will be electrons because the cathode is negatively charged. So that's what you get. So that water will have an oxidative reductive potential that's negative, negative voltage. And it's stable for about a day. It doesn't get grounded or lose its charge unless you were to put it in metal and then uh, set it somewhere. But if you keep it in glass, uh, that's fine. I'll talk about the water from the anode later on. It, it actually has other uses, for example, in uh, agriculture and in sanitation. But we would be drinking this alkaline fraction. For one, the blood is an alkaline fluid, and so is the internal compartment of the body. Between 7.2 and 7.4 is mild alkalinity. And you can't live at any pH less than 7.2 in the blood. It's highly buffered. Even though the pH of your saliva or your urine may be quite acidic if you take it with pH paper, the blood is highly maintained because things don't function in the body. So in other words, uh, the body will excrete acid, you'll urinate it, uh, you'll get rid of it to maintain that physiological pH. But ideally, we would like to have pH 7.4 rather than 7.2. Now, why is that? Because 7.4, uh, the, the more oxygen uh, can enter the red blood cells and be delivered to the body, and blood just works better at pH 7.4. So ideally, we would like to move the biological terrain to more al alkaline pH. Uh, is that the water? I, no, I'm talking about the blood right now. I haven't talked about pH of water yet. I'm talking about why do we want to drink alkaline water? We want it because we want to move the blood up in pH and we want to neutralize acid wastes. When we metabolize sugars or fats or just burning, we're making CO2, right? We breathe it out. CO2 plus water, which is our, uh, becomes bicarbonate. Um, and there's an acidity to that. So uh, we want to get rid of the carbon dioxide in our bodies. We want to eliminate the acid, and there are other acid wastes from burning fats, etc. So 
There are the two fractions of electrolyzed water. The alkaline water it depends on the strength of your ionizer, but generally you get a pH of the water between 8.5 and 10. And it contains the alkaline minerals, as I said before, and you, that's the fraction you drink. The acid water you could use for watering certain plants, especially acid-loving plants, um, and uh, actually is very good for sprouting seeds or the initial uh, soak. It's been shown to stimulate germination. Uh, but there are other things too that it does. And that will contain the anions like carbonate and sulfate, chloride, etc. And uh, in J Japan, the women have little spray containers of this acidic water. They're constantly spraying their face. It plumps out the minor wrinkles in the skin. Not a bad thing. Because the skin loves pH 4.5. The skin is an acid mantle. And the flora of the skin also thrive in that. And here we are washing our ourselves with soaps, with alkaline things all the time and, and uh, bathing. It's all wrong, really. I mean, soap is quite alkaline. It's the sodium salt of a fatty acid. It is, it is very alkaline. So we're actually re destroying the acid mantle of skin when something like this would be ideal wash water and uh, really great to spray on skin, uh, rashes, etc. And for cleaning vegetables and fruits. So. There are applications of the electrolyzed water in general, and we're talking about largely the domestic use, the drinking water here, but more in this region and the slightly alkaline water that we would like. Uh, because water on Earth, too, flowing in streams is slightly alkaline. Well water and w most water flowing on Earth is um, a pH 8, 8.5. Um, but very acidic water from strong ionization has its industrial uses of cleaning, etc. It's, it's um, cosmetic uses would like this pH, the skin is about pH 5, 4.5. And then extreme alkaline water at that end is also used for cleaning. The interesting thing about these waters is that they don't leave any residue. You know, when you spray your face with pH 4 water, you're not leaving a, any kind of residue. If you're spraying crops, as we'll talk about later, you're not leaving any residue. And you're diminishing the use of a lot of agricultural pesticides and herbicides to use some of these waters at the extreme ends. So let's talk now about the, the drinking water fraction. As I said, it has a negative oxidative reductive potential. What does that mean? Well, we can measure it with a device that looks very much like a pH meter, but it's an ORP meter in the laboratory. I have one. It's different electrodes than the pH electrode. It measures the potential and the units are millivolts. So we're talking about drinking water that's minus 150 to minus 300 millivolts. And that means it's a strong antioxidant. An antioxidant that can travel quickly through the body and combat free radical chemistry, which is uh, the chemistry of aging. The chemistry of peroxides, of um, of superoxide ions. Uh, oxygen is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, we need it, we breathe it, and then we create free radicals that are um, attacking our biomolecules from DNA to proteins and, and playing havoc with our, our life force. So we need to nip that in the bud. And a strong antioxidant like this water that can travel freely through the body and deliver electrons is a good thing. To drink. And by the way, if we were to drink water flowing on the earth, we would be drinking water about the same oxidative reductive potential at the source, that is, not in a bottle. Put in a bottle and traveling like this, it's no longer minus 100 millivolts. I've measured these waters, all of them. The good ones like Evian or um, uh, what's the water from? Fiji. Fiji. That's one of the best waters in terms of taste. It doesn't retain any negative uh, potential. All the bottled waters are positive potentials, as is your tap water. All the tap waters are plus 100 or more millivolts. And so we've stripped water of its rich electrons and in the way we hold it in stagnant ways. And the glass bottled water is very different? I haven't measured a lot of water coming in glass, just Voss. Again, a positive potential, um, not a negative one. So. Anything put in a jar, I learned that as a girl. I, I put a butterfly in a jar, put the lid on, and what happens? Well, it doesn't stay alive too long. Sad thing. And then you learn that life cannot be uh, separated from uh, nature. Yeah. 
Question back there. Not that I know of, but uh, I mean, I wouldn't do heating. I think if you're heating it, it's hard to say. Um, it's better made at the source and drunk there. So you ha there are devices to do this at the end. I'll show you some. <laughs> so what's in that water? That uh, There are a couple things besides electrons. There's active hydrogen. And more recently, there's an interest in hydrogen water. You may have seen this. And, and you drop little tablets in, and you make bubbly hydrogen in your water. And people are raving about it. But it's not the same as ionized water, even though ionized water has hydrogen. And I'll tell you an experiment they did. With, uh, with the hydrogen tablets put in water, then they can degas the water, uh, remove all the gas, put it in a vacuum or something, suck all the gas out. And it doesn't have any uh, negative ORP or anything. Then the properties are gone. Uh, there is hydrogen in the ionized alkaline water. And if you degas it, it still retains the high negative ORP. So the waters are not equivalent. Although there's a lot of raving about hydrogen water. And where does that come from? It comes from analyzing certain spas on the Earth. In Japan, they found a spa where there was a lot of hydrogen in the water. And people were saying remarkable cures there. And so then it became <coughs> known. And then people started figuring out ways to make hydrogen bubble up in drinking water with these supplements that you throw in water. But that's not the same as drinking uh, ORP, high negative ORP water, or water flowing on the earth, which also would have a high negative ORP. Yeah, I'd rather hold questions at the end unless they're points of clarity. So let me know if it is. Um, well, just about mountain stream water, like, I would imagine it depends if it's, could it be negative ORP and a high or low pH? Well, most, most waters flowing on the earth are not low pH because they're flowing over minerals. And, you know, calcium and, uh, yeah, but most water is, is, even if it might be 7.5, it's, it's more in the realm of physiological pH. Yeah. Well, let's talk about specifics and questions. Thank you. Uh, so the properties are very similar to mountain stream water. There's also a fresh, clean taste to this water that, and a feeling on the tongue of, um, very, a smooth, silky feel on the tongue, which is very interesting. I have often called the water the champagne of waters. So here's, I've measured this. this these are my measurements in the laboratory. So having an ORP meter, this is, this is the oxidative reductive potential and the negative values, the zero, and the positive values. These are, uh, Evian is the French Alps water at the source, but it comes in plastic bottles like this. And then Aquafina is, I believe, Pepsi-Cola, and Dasani is made by Coca-Cola. They're the most common bottled waters in the United States. And then there's the water from the ionizer. And you see that none of these bottled waters, even the one from a mountain source, retain any positive, uh, excuse me, any negative ORP. And I've measured others. I'm just showing you a few here. They all have the same fate. Um, they're showing positive ORP. So there are other properties of electrolyzed alkaline water. One is a reduced surface tension, which helps it become better absorbed. It's also a better solvent. It's so-called wetter when you reduce that surface tension. That's what soap does to water. It reduces the surface tension and enables it to be uh, um, a better cleaner, better carrier way of, of uh, debris and dirt. And as I said, it's a, an antioxidant activity is very high. It's a donor of electrons, something that we need to scavenge the free radicals of um, the many um, reactions, the reactive oxygen species in our body. So let me show you, and I have to watch the time. How am I doing? OK. Uh, biological and clinical studies on ionized water. This is from the literature, and then later I have some of my own data. Uh, so this is the best studied structured water in the literature. That's one reason I'm presenting it. There are many others, and there are many claims out there. And I show, show me the beef. Show me third-party laboratories that have done the research that substantiates how something structures water and has beneficial effects. That's why I'm presenting this, because it has 50 to 100 papers in the English language alone, and a lot more in Asian languages that I don't read, because the water is more heavily known and used in Russia and Asia than it is in the West. So 
Uh, here's a paper. Um, scavenges active oxygen species and protects DNA from oxidative damage. That's important. And it done in Japan, but happens to be in English. Here's a paper. Ionized alkaline water prevents oxidative cleavage of proteins. Another one. Um, and these are all peer-reviewed papers from the uh, medical and scientific literature. Animal studies show prolonged lifespan. Let me show you this. This was done in Texas uh, by Dr. Fernandez. He looked at different strains of mice and he fed the mice uh, the ionized alkaline water from birth and he tried it at two different pHs, pH 9.5 and pH 10.0. How do you do that? Well, you, you have a stronger electrolysis, more electrode plates, to get the stronger water, which is more alkaline and has a higher ORP. And then he found, uh, compared, uh, the, these are different mouse strains. Um, so he's comparing the lifetime of a mouse, which is about 225 days in this strain, fed just tap water. And what happens when the mice are fed uh, water at pH 9.5? Well, they live more days and it becomes significant, especially at pH 10 in this strain. It was a little less significant in this strain. But there you see, in mammals, it's enhancing life, length of life. That's important. What else do we know about lifespan? Um, here's something on, um, I do have another paper on it. Let's see, oh, this is by Fernandez. He looked to see what's going on that lifespan may be increased. And he found reduced peroxide levels in the blood serum, increased enzyme that's a key detoxifying enzyme, superoxide dismutase. Superoxide is the, uh, the ion O2 with a minus charge, okay? So that's um, a big free radical that wants to do damage in your body. And the enzyme superoxide dismutase breaks it down and neutralizes it. And that enzyme then is increased in activity in mice drinking the ionized alkaline water compared to tap water. So, uh, so it's breaking down these, these uh, free radicals in living bodies, which are the result of ordinary metabolism. So superoxide dismutase is known to be key to lifespan regulation. And here's a paper on this. Um, superoxide, first of all, is the most abundant reactive oxygen species, ROS. I'm going to use that word throughout this lecture. So when we have reactive oxygen species, these things can damage us and they have to be contained. They go on in the mitochondria, the, the one reason that the mitochondria have a con convoluted system of membranes to try to contain it. Um, but then we learn things like glyphosate is uh, disturbing those membranes, disturbing the tight gap junctures, etc. So these free radicals then get out and are, well, they're also in the bloodstream to some extent, uh, but we want to nip them in the bud because they damage biomolecules, they do oxidative damage uh, that are correlated with aging, and the SOD is one of the key enzymes that neutralizes them, catalyzes the breakdown of superoxide into hydrogen peroxide in water, and then there are peroxidases, enzymes that break down that peroxide and further neutralize this whole waste problem of uh, oxygen metabolism. So when we see enhanced activity of SOD, uh, we know that oxidative damage can be reduced and this could be a possible modus operandi for why those mice live longer. So now here's uh, another study on longevity. This is on C. elegans. Uh, it's a worm that's well studied in biology, not a common worm in the soil or anything. It's a very tiny thing. Uh, and they found that it extends the lifespan also of that worm. Again, considered to be due to its uh, scavenging action of uh, free radicals. And most of these studies were not done in the United States, they're done abroad. Now what about clinical studies? Here's a, uh, some literature on patients with kidney disease. And again, these are short-term studies, like looking at um, sick people who drank the water for 30 days. What happens to kidney patients who are undergoing hemodialysis? So this is kind of end-stage kidney disease. And it's well known that hemodialysis, just the process of getting it, increases reactive oxygen species. And that's one of the causes of, of uh, death in these patients. But drinking the ionized elk and water fraction reduces the reactive oxygen species. And it also reduced blood inflammatory markers in kidney patients, C-reactive protein and interleukin-6. 
two markers of inflammation went down. That's a very good thing because chronic inflammation, especially in a population like this with chronic disease, uh, is, uh, is actually one of the underlying factors of chronic disease is the turning on of, of uh, uh, an inflammatory pathways in the body and the making of C-reactive protein and interleukin-6. So anytime we can nip chronic inflammation in the bud, we've paved the way for greater health and longevity. So that's 30 days of just drinking water. I mean, there haven't really been long-term studies on humans. I've been drinking the water for 20 years, and I have to say my blood parameters are perfect, and I'll show you some pictures of blood. Also, how my blood looks compared to my age group is another thing. Here's studies on diabetes. Uh, reactive oxygen species is very high in diabetes. Um, it's, diabetes is almost like a disease of uh, faster aging than the normal population, than the healthy population. So besides the other, the blood sugar effects and um, circulatory issues, etc., that is a fact that ROS is a big problem in diabetics and it's also involved in progressive pancreatic dysfunction. So scavenging of reactive oxygen species in diabetics would be very important to help control diabetes. And here's a study on diabetic animals. So they have mo mice models of diabetes type 1, a genetic diabetes, and uh, uh, metabolic syndrome and diabetes type 2 mice. And the ionized water fed to them improved insulin sensitivity in both diabetic mice type 1 and 2 and reduced blood glucose. No insulin here. So studies on diabetic patients. This was an uncontrolled study. It was a rather large study, though. 411 type 2 diabetics, mean age 71.5, drank ionized alkaline water for up to 2 liters a day for over 6 days. Very short-term study. What happens? 45% should reduce blood glucose. Oh, my God. In just less than a week of drinking this water, improved cholesterol and creatinine levels. And 70% showed decreased reactive oxygen species in the blood. This is big. Everybody should be drinking this water. Diabetes is epidemic in, my, uh, in, in what we know, and it's only getting worse, especially type 2. So what about cancer? We don't have uh, clinical data on people with cancer, but we do have it on cancer cells in the laboratory, as far as I know. And cancer produces more reactive oxygen species than normal tissue, and antioxidants can inhibit, can inhibit cancer growth. So that's known. So tumor cells in vitro, which means in the laboratory and culture, it inhibited human tongue cancer cell colony formation and inhibited growth of human fibrosarcoma cells. So those are two types of cancer. And um, leukemia cells, ionized alkaline water, produce enhanced mitochondrial damage uh, and apoptosis of the leukemic cells, but not of the normal cells. So actually enhanced uh, cell death. Apoptosis is natural cell death. So sped up apoptosis in cancer cells. But Normal leukocytes were not made cytotoxic from the water. So it indicates it's selective in nailing cancer. Uh, again, these are short-term studies. They're all in vitro, but it looks promising. And, and I haven't seen the money, the funding to bring it to clinical trials in humans because like many natural things, you can't patent it. Uh, you can't get the big dollars. And therefore, the big research money is just not out there. And I've been un unable to get it myself from the NIH, National Institutes of Health. So here's another topic, toxicology. You may wonder, well, is this water toxic? And what happens when we feed it to developing or pregnant animals? A good question. Now, uh, as far as mutagenicity, the Ames test with salmonella looks for whether there's a mutation in salmonella. It's a bacteria. And they didn't find any enhanced mutation rate. Therefore, it's not mutagenic. And uh, then they looked at Chinese hamster lung fibroblasts. That's also a model system for looking at chromosome aberrations. They didn't find any chromosome aberrations. And the rats given the water, only the water for 28 days, had no symptoms or abnormalities either. Uh, in other animal studies, and this is more important because pregnant and developing rats are, are more sensitive generally to chemicals. 
And so ionized alkaline water given to pregnant rats, to lactating rats, normal milk production, normal offspring, and faster postnatal growth of those young rats just born with mothers fed this water. So that's a good indicator that there's, there's not really a toxic effect, as well as the longevity study on mice that I showed you earlier. Protective effect on the liver. Mice with chemically induced liver damage, given uh, the ionized alkaline water, showed lower liver enzyme levels and increased superoxide dismutase. Uh, if you go in for a blood test and your liver enzymes are elevated, it's a sign of liver damage or fatty liver or some liver pathology, maybe even hepatitis. So reducing those uh, and liver enzyme levels in the blood is a good thing. Changes seen in the terrain. Now this is where I've done work. And what is the terrain? What am I talking about? This is the soil of the body. Here we're learning a lot about soil, but there's an inner soil uh, as well. And that's the fluid in which all of your cells live, uh, in which they're bathed. So you might say it's the plasma fraction of blood, but we also look at the blood cells too, because I'm looking at whole blood under the microscope. And with it, what about the microbial load of the body? What do we see in blood? Conventional science and medicine said blood is sterile if you're healthy. I haven't seen that under the microscope. I see microbes. And microbial load is quite variable depending upon what you eat and drink. And if you come to my fireside chat this afternoon, I'll show you a video of uh, a woman who drank only soda pop, only pH 3 to 4 beverages uh, for many years and what that blood looks like in terms of microbial load. You'll be amazed. So this is about the body's ecology. So we have soil ecology and then we have the inner terrain uh, ecology. And this is important just as in agriculture. If the soil's bad, it doesn't support life. The plants are stunted or they don't grow. And if the terrain of the body is deficient, if it's toxic or congested, your cells don't flourish. So it's very important to have a clean, healthy terrain. And that's something not looked at in conventional medicine. But I'm a research scientist and I've been looking at the terrain in different people in various studies for over 20 years. And one of the things I can tell you is that the terrain is going bad quickly. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One is increased consumption of processed foods and foods trucked all over the world. As you know, the issues, uh, not fresh, contaminated, etc. cetera. Uh, poisons in the environment um, and bad water. The stagnant water that we drink in bottles that has no electrons. At the end, at the end, the very end. I also gave a handout. If you're missing it, they're up here. Um, so the greater the integrity of the biological terrain, the healthier is the body. And I do something called live blood analysis. That's visual examination of a small droplet of blood taken from the finger or the toe. I looked at both uh, because sometimes I was looking at the influence of cell phone radiation. People hold the cell phone and they work with it. And I found some amazing results of that, not very healthy. So then I started looking at toe blood because people said, well, maybe it's just local, but it isn't. The effects of cell phone radiation on, on your blood is a real thing and it's systemic. And I'll say something about that later. So then I've got a microscope. I'm looking with dark field or face contrast microscope and I can magnify the blood up to, well, light microscopy goes up to about 1500 power and then I use video camera enhancement and get it up to about 8,000 power. So I can really see a lot of things in blood. And keep in mind that normal medical exams of your blood, you give blood, they test it, they give you a, a, a complete blood count, a CBC, and they may give you an analysis of major nutrients and enzymes and things in the blood. No human eyes ever look at your blood. It's all robotics. The technician then may put an aliquot of your blood in a tube that goes in the machine and all the an analysis is done. Nobody ever looks at your blood. That's, in my opinion, you know, only half of the exam. I want to look at the quality of your blood. I want to look at how those cells look. Are they uniform in size or are they different? It tells me something about the level of nutrition. So live blood analysis shows a lot of interesting things that conventional testing doesn't show. It shows shape changes in red blood cells, the variability in size. It shows whether cells are clumped or whether they're integral holes and separated from one another as they should be. It shows the white blood cells, a relative number. You can see leukemia, lymphoma for sure, and not other types of cancer. 
And um, we can distinguish the various types of white blood cells under the microscope and look at, at whether they're swimming. They should be motile, like amoebas moving around the slide. And then we look at the plasma. The space between the cells is, uh, carries fat. And in a fasted person, we see tiny particles uh, where the fat doesn't mix with water, of course. The body packages fat and something called chylomicrons that uh, they're tiny particles, you can see them bouncing around under the microscope. It's brownie in motion. And we see platelets sometimes aggregating, again, the first stage of clotting. We see sometimes dead arterial cells or other uh, epithelial cells indicating maybe vitamin C is low. Uh, we can see cholesterol crystals and other crystals, and then we see fibrin, clotting. And I see sometimes parasites in people, especially people consuming raw meat or raw fish like sushi that was in, inappropriately f not frozen and thawed fully. I can see hair coloring particles after somebody just dyes their hair. I can see tobacco smoke. I can see the effects of tobacco smoke and other smoke on your blood. So one of the questions when I look at the blood is, how fast does your blood rust or rot? I'm looking at the blood and I'm watching it for an hour. Sometimes I watch it for 24 hours. People who are smokers, the blood, the blood bursts like balloons, like the cells literally burst within an hour. And after an hour, there's no more blood there. Just burst blood cells. Why? Because there's so, much, so many free radicals from smoking tobacco that then have attacked the cell membrane to burst all those cells in just a matter of an hour. So that's uh, the rusting of blood, so to speak, uh, the oxidation of it. The rotting of blood is... Uh, do I see a microbial load increasing as the blood sits on the slide? In an hour, do I see uh, a bunch of microbes coming out from those cells? Yes, sometimes, especially people consuming the wrong types of food. And of course, it's all about biological integrity and resistance to stress and disease. So we take a finger prick uh, through a sterile lancet. The droplet of blood is put on a slide in my microscope here. Uh, and then I have uh, various lenses. Um, I'm using dark field condenser. This is dark field microscopy, video cameras, etc., hooked to the computer. And everybody watches their blood. I do this as an educational experience and research. It's outside the context of medicine because it's not legal as medicine in the United States. It was about 60 years ago. In the 1960s, it was used in medicine. And, and, uh, but it's been removed uh, due to various laws over the years. Doctors can't look at blood, laboratories, uh, unless you have a clinical laboratory license, which costs maybe $150,000 a year, you can't do this medically. So you want to come and join my health and wellness club, then we can do this and explore your blood. So here's perfectly clean, wonderful blood. It is so rare nowadays, I'm sorry to say, What's good about this blood? All the red blood cells here shown just on the edges in dark field are about the same size. They're separate. They're not stuck together. And the plasma is clean and clear. This is fasted blood. And you have to fast for this test because otherwise we see a blizzard of fat. So people have to come in five hours after eating any, any meal. Uh, so, but this is so rare, I hardly ever see it. And here's also clean blood. This is in I'll tell you who it is. It's uh, Sally Fallon, who is president of the Weston A. Price Foundation. She doesn't mind me telling you that. She has one of the best bloods. And she's an elder person. She was uh, in her 60s when I took this sample. And what did I catch here? Uh, I caught a, whoops, sorry, I hit the wrong key. I, I caught a white blood cell uh, polymorphonucleotide in the act of moving toward 2 o'clock. So you see she had active motility of the white blood cells. She has pretty clean plasma, a couple of little platelet aggregates. But other than that, this is superb blood for a person in her age group. Here's another close-up of a cell, white blood cell, uh, in the act of moving like an amoeba, which they do. They, they, you can watch them uh, swim around and kind of engulf a particle, check it out, take it in, maybe digest it. These vesicles inside white blood cells are... Um, these white vesicles contain enzymes that digest all kinds of things. They break down proteins, lipids, etc. So they can, they're the policemen that go all over the body and scavenge for you. They take in cancer cells, viruses, microbes that don't belong, and they consume them. 
And then they get so big and bloated that you need to get rid of them. So you sneeze them out of your nose or excrete them through the stool. Uh, so here's deficient blood. I'll just show you a few blood pictures before I move on to water. So why is this deficient? You see these hollowed out what we call target cells. You see how small that cell is relative to this one? This one was made on a day when that person lacked iron and protein, and this is a normal healthy red blood cell. So the variability of nutrition obvious in this sample is a sign of uh, irregular nutrition because you make three million or so blood cells every day and you can see some of them made are, are tiny and deficient in iron and protein and other days it looks good. So there's a lot to be seen here that can't be seen in conventional blood tests. I can see many deficiencies. Uh, so typical blood in recent years doesn't look good like that. It looks more like this. Mm -hmm. This is the first stage of what cell phone radiation does to your blood. I studied people, um, I think it was 12 people with cell phone turned on in a backpack wearing it for 45 minutes. They weren't even touching the phone. The phone was on. They were just wearing it. And Several of them, about 70%, showed some level of aggregation of the cells. Now, what's going on here? This is like a roll of coins looking at it on end. If you had a roll of coins and you could see through the wrapper, you'd see the edges of the nickels. So now we're seeing red blood cells stacked. And this phenomenon is called rouleau. Rouleau is uh, the French word for coins, or stacks, rolls. So then we're looking at all the red blood cells tied up in rouleau. And you, peripheral circulation is tremendously compromised when you have blood like this. People will feel tired, sluggish. And that's one reaction from uh, uh, wireless communication radiation is some people feel tired. They wonder what's going on. Well, if, if circulation is now dependent on blood like this, it does not get through the tiniest capillaries in all your organs and tissues. So that's problematic. We see this hypercoagulation. Early coagulation of the blood is a sign that the inflammatory cascade has been turned on, which means chronic inflammation is at work. And part, part of the reason we have this is due to uh, the high omega-6 in the, in the American diet in our, in, among fats. In other words, we're not getting the proper balance of omega-3, 6, 9 in our diets. So it's pushing us into a pro-inflammatory chemistry. And then when you have that, early clotting ensues, hypercoagulation, a sign of underlying inflammatory response turned on chronically. And that's at the root of chronic disease, all of them. Autoimmunity, cancer, heart disease. Uh, so we want to nip that in the bud. We don't want chronic inflammation. And so people take things like fish oil. They eat pastured meats that have a better ratio of omega-369 than, than the commercial meats fed corn and soy. <coughs> this is how most people look in modern times. This is your average, even young person eating fast food, your average middle-aged person eating canola oil and ordinary beef and chicken and I would say processed foods. This is hypercoagulation. This white threads are fibrin and the red blood cells are all aggregated. This blood clotted in just a minute as I laid it down in the slide. And that shouldn't happen. And hypercoagulation, as, as you age, is one of the most problematic things. People are at risk for thrombosis, for heart disease, and stroke because their blood is, uh, needs a blood thinner. And then they get drugs like Coumadin and other things, which is really rat poison. Uh, and there are other ways to manage this that are much safer than taking drugs that have, have a very narrow therapeutic window and then a lot of problems at the low end and at the high end. So. So here's uh, blood sludge, we call it. We don't know what it is. It looks like platelet aggregates and more, but it's stuff in the plasma that shouldn't be there. And if it gets lodged somewhere in a microcapillary, that's the beginning of a thrombosis or a stroke or a heart attack. So we shouldn't see things like that in the blood plasma. This is an example of uh, a stagnant biological terrain. We have a lot of stagnant things that we're consuming. We should expect nothing less than stagnancy in our bodies. Stagnant water, stagnant food, old food that doesn't have any vitality. What do we get? We get stagnant. Now this is the ultimate. This is degenerative blood. This is microbes in the blood. What did this person do? Too many antibiotics. We get fungal overgrowth in the blood. That's what these fibers are. Yes. 
And conventional medicine says your, your body, your blood is sterile. Well, when they try to plate it and grow it in media in the lab, that doesn't mean it. They can't isolate it, but that doesn't mean it's sterile. If you look at the blood, native blood, you see stuff like this. It's got fungal forms. And of course, if you get rid of the bacteria in the body, then what moves in? Opportunistic fungus. That's what you get. It's a no-brainer. And lots of people have women who take penicillin or something end up with vaginal yeast infections. It's a common overgrowth of candida in the gut and vaginal uh, flora after antibiotic therapy. So there it is. Whoops. So let me show you a case study. So here's a man, 65 years old. This is pretty typical blood for an elderly person. Uh, again, it's hypercoagulation. It's too much fibrin and sticky cells that are not single. So the cells have lost their net negative charge. They, they can't, they're touching one another. They're not independent. And the fibrin is enormous. And there's another picture of it. Pockets of fibrin and aggregates of red blood cells. Hardly any single ones at all. And again, at a higher magnification, you see that those fibers like spider webs. And now he drank 1 to 1.5 liters a day of the ionized alkaline water for six months. This is a client of mine. pH 9.5 or P minus 250 millivolts. Now let's see what his blood looks like. There we go. Much improved. What happened? I don't see early fibrin. The cells are pretty well formed. There's a little stickiness, but it isn't that bad. It's certainly much improved. Here's another picture. Now these kinds of Things here are the little bit of fibrin here. This is what happens when blood clots. The cells lose their shape and they form walls. Uh, like a brick, uh, they fill in space. So this, this shape change is due to a tiny clot here. But other than that, this blood looks much improved. And it's just six months of drinking the water. So I've seen about 10 cases like this where we see reduced red blood cell stickiness, reduced aggregation of the cells reduce platelet aggregation, reduce fibrin formation. Those are healthy changes. Blood should not, within the first 10 minutes, show hypercoagulation, or you're on the road to cardiovascular disease. What are the implications of this? Improved peripheral circulation. Longer blood coagulation time is associated with decreased inflammatory processes. So it shows that inflammation, the, that chronic type of inflammation, which is at the root of chronic disease, has apparently been reduced. And that is associated with a reduced risk of chronic degenerative disease. And chronic degenerative disease is the number one disease types of our times. It is an acute disease. People are dying, as you know, of stroke, heart disease, um, cancer, autoimmunity, etc. Those are the chronic disorders. So what's the possible modus operandi? I think the water is giving rich electrons, uh, enriching electrons, it's giving the red blood cells electrons directly. Those red blood cells should have a net negative charge. That's the natural state and the healthy state of red blood cells. If they all had a net negative charge, they would repel one another because like charges repel. That's basic electrostatics. However, they've lost their charges and they get stuck together. They don't have any charge. But the water replenishes it. It gives them electrons. And also the antioxidant activity of the ionized alkaline water may impact numerous biochemical redox reactions, cleaning up those free radicals, et cetera, which are also involved in the inflammatory cascades. So let me see how I'm doing for time. We have 30 minutes, right? Yeah, I think so. so there's a relationship between inflammation and blood clouding. And when you have this kind of hypercoagulation as this gentleman had, or early clotting, uh, it's linked to the chronic inflammation cascade being turned on. So when the immune response is inappropriately turned on all the time, then you get inflammation, and then you get an activation of the blood clotting cascade. And that's a response that would be to wall off some invading entity like a microbe. But there is no microbe. You're just doing this inflammatory response and there's nothing to fight. And that's a problem. And then you, you get sick when you have that going on. And then you have more coagulation and fibrin and they further promote inflammatory activities because every time 
part of the clotting cascade goes on, inflammatory peptides are released, which exacerbate the whole condition. And then you're really on the road to chronic disease. So, so here's one way that ionized alkaline water is combating aging. So these are some factors about aging. First, as I said, dehydration. It improves hydration. It's absorbed readily. It has a low surface tension. There's been studies to show that that I didn't show you, but it does improve hydration. Uh, metabolic acid and other toxic substances build up with just aging, ordinary metabolism. This water penetrates throughout the body, neutralizes acid because it's alkaline, dissolves and removes waste, and quenches the free radicals the, through elevating superoxide dismutase and peroxidases. Then we see, um, as part of aging, increasing free radicals and cumulative oxidative damage with uh, increased antioxidant activity and superoxide dismutase activity. We're, we're biting that in the bud. Over here with um, aging, we see progressive organ dysfunction and we're preventing oxidative damage to DNA and other biomolecules and slowing down organ dysfunction. So it has a net anti-aging effect and a lifespan increase in some of the lower animals. So let me show you now, turning to a, a, another slightly different experiment. That's the end of the clinical aspect here. Uh, you saw Jerry Pollock talk, and my laboratory has also done studies on the exclusion zone. What is the exclusion zone? In case you weren't there, you put a charged membrane. This is not a living membrane. This is something called nafion. It's a it's an organic type membrane that has a lot of sulfate groups on here having a net negative charge. And then we put a colloid, in this case some polystyrene microspheres with also charged. And then we, get a, we let it sit for about six minutes and we get a clear zone and that's the exclusion zone. And Jerry Pollock's work shows that this water in the interface has a different structure than the bulk water out here. Okay, if you didn't hear his talk. He's saying that this interfacial water has a slightly different structure than the water out here. Okay, now based on that, I did some experiments. We created a custom device to study the EZ uh, exclusion zone kinetics optically in my lab because I was interested in using it as a bioassay. Whether different waters would have different types of exclusion zones was my question. So here's the, here's the device, and Harry Jabs built it, my partner. And it's a device, by virtue of flow, we can take the water in uh, on a microscope slide, let it sit there next to the membrane, and then we measure optically the exclusion zone over time. And he has a program to, um, in, in software to analyze the rate of the formation of the exclusion zone. So here's uh, a schematic of the device. Um, I won't go into much detail, but he had uh, built the hardware and then the hardware software control of it and also the software to analyze the data. So it was a lot of work. And we were also doing experiments on whether energy healers could influence the rate of formation or the endpoint of the exclusion zone, because we're interested in, in energy healing in my lab. So, so then here we see on the computer screen, uh, we have actually a piece of nafion here and another one here, and you can see kind of an exclusion zone in that region. And we're looking at the rate of formation of that exclusion zone. And here we're comparing tap water on the left and alkaline ionized water on the right. Uh, and you can see something about the exclusion zone is very interesting. It isn't just a clear zone, then it appears to be a band of colloids that forms later on. And my laboratory invested different colloids, uh, investigated different colloids. We looked at milk, we looked at uh, other natural colloids, uh, and we found very um, elaborate formations near the exclusion zone. In other words, it isn't so simple as a clear zone, as Gerald Pollack reports, although he's looking only at standardized colloids that are uh, uniform in size, something you can purchase off the shelf. And, but we're looking at natural colloids that have particles of different sizes, like soil would have, or like blood has, or like milk. With, uh, unhomogenized milk has very non-uniform fat particle sizes and protein particles. And those give rise to enormously complex patterns at the exclusion zone. And you can look at that in my paper, which is on my website. So anyway, alkaline ionized water had a different profile, a different size of the exclusion zone, and this band is different than the placement here. So it showed a different pattern. What does that mean? Does that mean it's yet another kind of structure of water? I think so. I think there are many types of structures of water. 
Jerry Pollock has found one, but I think other evidence like um, through Raman spectroscopy and other ways of looking at water has shown mu many subtle differences between one kind of structured water and another, suggesting that water has innumerable ways of structuring itself. It's not just hydrogen bonding, that there's a lot more going on. And that may explain things like homeopathy that have boggled the mind for a long time, how extremely high dilutions of a substance can have biological effects, even when there's no more molecules of the substance that was getting diluted. And so maybe we can explain that finally with this innumerable ways of water structures itself. So. So anyway, um, let me move on. So let's talk about the agricultural applications. It's been known that if you soak the seeds in these waters, you get faster germination and a kind of a boost to growth of plants. That's in the literature. Sometimes it's the acidic side and sometimes it's the alkaline. It depends what the plant prefers. You have to know that or, or experiment with it. Here are some studies on plants. And uh, some of this is on hydrogen rich, rich water which is related to ionized water. Uh, and more of these are rather recent in the literature. But what if soil has cadmium poison or other mercury poison? Or, you know, industrial areas are now, well, they've contaminated the soil. And what do we do about that? Can we still grow things? What, what happens? Well, here's a study that shows it in, improves and reduces cadmium uptake in Chinese cabbage. So this water was, um, I believe it was a foliar spray used. And they saw a reduction of cadmium uptake by Chinese cabbage, re increased antioxidant capacity of the plant, and that same oil enzyme profile, superoxide dismutase activity goes up. And peroxide, uh, peroxidases also go up. So the, the enzymes that detoxify free radicals uh, is in, are increased, even in cabbage. Fascinating. So the same kind of chemical changes in the animal world are now seen in the plant world. And this may be a new strategy then to deal with things like cadmium con contaminated soils. And what about mercury? Here's one on mercury toxicity in alfalfa. Now mercury itself uh, produces reactive oxygen species in alfalfa seedlings. That's problematic. It stunts growth and increases lipid peroxidation. But this is application of the water. Uh, again, this is uh, at the early stage. I believe it's watering the seedlings, not foliar spray. But application of the water reduced oxidative stress and mercury accumulation decreased. And again, those enzymes, superoxide, dismutase, and peroxidase were increased, which are your major detoxification systems done in China. Then I've got a study here, control of powdery mildew by spraying, this is foliar spray, but there's no, nothing in it, it's just the water, spraying electrolyzed water on strawberry crops. In some cases, it was the acid fraction, so that's pH 4 or so. In other cases, they mixed the acid and the alkaline fractions after electrolysis, and they used it as a foliar spray. There's no residue in the crops, and it was reduced use of chemical fungicides. So it's, it had a fungicide-like activity or protective effect. Yes? Um, do you know if that would I don't know that. It, it wasn't in this paper. Good question. But the electrolyzed water, especially the acid water, is known to kill broad spectrum. So it's possible that it might be removing some of the kill. Uh, but it might. I haven't seen studies on skin uh, microbial ecology. I can just say the Japanese women are busy. It's a cosmetic thing in their purses. And, they're constantly spraying their, their faces, uh, which I consider far better than most of the chemicals people put on their skin, so there. <laughs> um, so what about uh, the acid water? Well, it's a broad spectrum uh, sanitizer, so it can be used to wipe countertops in restaurants or hospitals. And nobody really knows exactly how it works. Uh, some think it's the high ORP. That's an active agent. Microbes don't like that. Uh, many of them don't. Others think that um, HOCl, that would be like a hypochloric acid as an active agent. That would be if the, there was some chloride in the water or you started with sodium chloride water in your electrolysis. So sanitizer effect. Uh, but one of the amazing things is this, that 30-second exposure 
of very strong acid water, the oxidizing fraction kills the MRSA. That's important. The multiple resistance Staphylococcus aureus, if you don't know what that is, uh, that's one of the most heinous species of uh, contaminating bacteria lurking in hospitals and medical centers. The people get infections and they can't get rid of them. There's no, they're so antibiotic resistant. Multiple resistant Staphylococcus aureus, and MRSA as it's called. So it's killing MRSA. That's a very useful thing. Uh, if somebody has an infection, they can just spray this, this highly intense water on and get over this kind of heinous staph infection. So, the high pH. no, this is the low the pH. pH. This is the acidic water, the ionized the acidic pH. water. How what? You know, what pH? I don't know exactly what pH. You'd have to go to the source here, but it would be below four. It's probably pH three or two. So, the acidic water treats eczema. I had a funny rash on my face that later I found was related to a plant growing in my garden, a flower. It was a uh, tanacetum. <laughs> I don't know, I got allergic to it somehow. I love it and then I had to get rid of it. I, I had this florist classic rash. Someone said, that's tanacetum rash. I said, oh, I never knew. So I squirted the acidic water in my face and the rash went away magically in three days. And people with eczema, also find uh, the rashes clear up. Psoriasis, not so. <coughs> so, anyway, that's just from multiple practitioners that I've spoken with. That's not really in the literature that I could find. So now I want to show you some experiments, I have to check my time, uh, about subtle energy in water. I do a lot of testing of uh, different devices that may structure water for, for commercial sales, etc. I'm the third party lab people come to sometimes to test this device, see what it does to water, okay. And I might do microbial experiments, I might run plant studies, and I might also look with this particular camera. This is the gas discharge visualization camera, as it's called, GDV camera, uh, that came from Russia. And it's a form of digital Kirlian photography. That means you put, um, in this case, I'm hanging a syringe with a drop of water just above a charged plate, and it's all in the dark. I'll show you on the next slide. It's a hanging drop method, so I'm really measuring the light that's going to come, the induced light uh, coming out of this drop of water hanging from a one milliliter syringe. And here's the setup. So the water has to be in the dark, and then they have this metal uh, thing to put over the syringe, so light from the room is excluded, and the syringe uh, droplet is hanging right over this charged lens, and then we take pictures of the light emitted from the water. It's called the corona discharge. Every object put onto a Kirlian camera lens will have a corona discharge. And now we're comparing the, the area of the light, the intensity of the light, the fractality of the light, and many parameters of the light coming out of the water and showing differences between structured water, tap water, etc. So I wanted to see which water carry the most light, the most energy as measured by the GDV camera. So I asked the question, what about mountain spring water done at the source? I can bring this camera out in the field and measure water flowing at, say, in the Sierras. And then I can do it in the laboratory, too. So, so this is um, Emeryville, California, municipal water. Now, actually, this is a negative. In other words, this would be a light pattern, and I've just uh, shown it here. So that's not very much energy. That's ordinary tap water. And then water from the High Sierra Stream in Truckee, California has a bigger light emission. This is the negative of it. You can see that. It's clear. What about water from the ionizer? It's also large. And this is from the starting tap water. So this is at my lab made from the Emeryville, California tap water. And you can see a large sparky thin extra spark flew out there. So you can see that it's similar energetically to water flowing in the High Sierras. That's good news. I have shown that it has restored energetically some, something, at least, of water flowing on Earth that we were meant to drink, God-given water, instead of this stuff flowing in municipal pipes. Yeah? So free-flowing water, not in pipes, will its um, acidity or alkalinity change in that during the flow? Or is it just a question of time that's away from its source? Well, it's, uh, w during the flow, remember, water's flowing over substrates of generally mineral rocks. I think so. Now, 
Now, where does the water get electrons flowing on Earth? That's a good question. Let me tell you something. There's a new theory that I really like. It's called the Electric Universe Theory. If you're interested in that, there's some great videos on YouTube. Uh, and it's so refreshing compared to the old cosmology. But according to this theory, the Earth is negatively charged at the surface. So anything flowing over it is getting negatively charged. And anything isolated from it, like this, has lost its charge. This isn't an insulator. We live in insulating rooms. We have insulating soles in our shoes. We are so electron depleted. We need to get grounded. And getting grounded means to get charged. Doesn't mean to get neutral. It means to get electrically charged again. Yes, take your shoes off and walk in the grass and on the dirt. I had a dream. A friend of mine had prostate cancer and I dreamt that his cure would be to sit with his bare buttocks on the sand. He lived near a beach. To bare his buttocks and sit in the sand and meditate. And that's what he did and he got over it. So, let me move on to questions at the end, okay? In printing water, okay, I've done a certain amount of this. I do workshops where people come together and we send water love, we send water healing energy, we send water different and we imbue it with different intentions. We get different patterns in the GDV. We get different patterns of energy when we use intention, especially in groups which have more power than any single individual. So I've been looking at that and I do workshops on it, it's a lot of fun, and show that intention, prayer, the blessing of water. What do people do? What is traditional? Bless your water, bless your food. I believe it may change subtly the energetic structure. And there's not a lot of experiments on that, but the GDV camera is one way we can show the light imbued in the water element is enhanced when we do that blessing. I'll just show you one bit of data. So this was done by a group 1,000 kilometers from my lab. Okay, this is the starting water. This is really low level. And post-treatment by a group long distance. And we had different stations of water, and I didn't know which one they energized. We used a GPS, and they chose it randomly by a dice, and they, they affected that water, and we found we could tell energetically by studying with the GDV which one had been affected. So it was a blinded experiment. I didn't know which station they were addressing. So that's a good experiment. And here's the best case. Now it's colorized, it's computer software that colorizes it, but here's the starting tap water, and here's what the best case I've ever seen with water imbued by love. And usually it's always enhanced, but this is tremendously enhanced. So. So let me move along, because I have limited time in 10 minutes. I'll stay around for some questions, too. And I do have a fireside chat today. Do you have a book? No, but I have papers. I'll show you at the end. I'm writing a book. OK, so the memory of water uh, is a whole other topic, and I, just, I can't give it service here in the time. But I just want to say a few things about it. I mentioned homeopathic medicine. Uh, that was the major medical system in the United States during the Civil War. And, and it was kind of emitted after the Flex, Flexner report about 100 years ago, and it fell into oblivion, and now allopathic medicine rose. And I think it rose with the, with the oil empire. There was no accident there. The oil empire facilitated the rise of allopathic medicine because allopathics are made out of, farm, uh, uh, out of oil. <coughs> In other words, petroleum is the starting chemistry of all drugs. That's what you start with, hydrocarbons, and then you, you do organic chemistry on them. So that's what happened. But anyway, there's interesting experiments, um, <clears throat> and also the evidence of homeopathy, of extremely high dilutions in water of substances that carry the memory of that substance. <coughs> Excuse me a minute. <coughs> and Jacques Benvenisse was one researcher um, <coughs> did this in 1988, showed qu quite a paper that raised a stir. Um, Rustin Roy at uh, Penn State was a very prominent material scientist who also looked at water's heterogeneous nanostructure, showing that water had regions of different structures. And the most amazing evidence that's come out recently is by the Nobel laureate Luc Montagnier. He's famous for having co-discovered the HIV virus with Gallo at NIH. 
and he's in France, <coughs> but he's now working on ultra-dilute water solutions of DNA and shows that they emit waves that affect pure water and you can communicate the information across the distance from a homeopathic dilution of DNA to a pure water. And, and then you can add enzymes and substrates and recover the original DNA in the second tube of water. It's really quite amazing. So, <clears throat> how to erase the memory of water? Now, why do we want to do that? Well, at least where I live, I get a report, the East Bay Municipal Utility District, or East Bay Mud, that tells me people are flushing their drugs down the toilet, and the East Bay Mud can't remove pharmaceutical drugs anymore from the water supply. There's too much of a load. So we're actually drinking low doses of pharmaceuticals in our tap water, probably where you live too. I just happen to be different place, but same problem because so many pharmaceutical drugs are in use today. So not only do I want to filter out that drug, I want to remove the memory of that drug from my drinking water because of the homeopathy principle, the low dose problem. So I can tell you this, strong electric and magnetic fields remove or erase the memory of water. And that's another reason for drinking ionized water because it's going through a very strong electric field. A high magnet will do the same job. Now, here's a summary. I'm almost at the end. Uh, we've talked about this. Um, the synergistic properties of the electrolyzed water, the alkalinity, the high negative ORP, like fresh vegetable juice but without the calories, the antioxidant effects, the healthful minerals retained in the water, which are essential. Uh, some people say it's microclustered, more bioavailable. It has a high energy signature. I just showed you that that's comparable to natural streams, and the residual memory of water is erased. There's been plenty of experiments showing a uh, strong DC field or, or magnetic field will erase the memory of water. Jacques Benveniste was one who started doing that back in the 80s. Now, the, now a bit about ionizer systems, because you asked about well, how do you make this water. You can make it at home. Now, first you need to have pre-filtered water. That's very important. You want to remove the microbes, oh, excuse me, I hit the wrong button here. Uh, you want to remove any microbes, spores, chloramine, chlorine, organic chemicals such as residual pharmaceutical drugs from use uh, of others, and fluoride from your starting tap water. Those are not helpful to your health. Uh, you want some of the other connects to all types of faucets. There are countertop units. Um, the electrodes are usually platinum coated. That's good. It's a precious metal. It's inert and you don't get platinum then in, in your water. Uh, and they're self-cleaning and self-maintaining. They reverse the polarity, and any crud that's building up on one electrode will then be removed during a cleaning cycle, not when you're taking the water to drink, by the way. And it's an intelligent machine that talks, even speaks English, even with an American accent made in Asia. <laughs> and there are pre-filters that are attached to it that <coughs> And LEDs that tell you the filter life. So it's really a no-brainer to operate one of these. Anybody can do it. Here's the outside of a simple one, hooked to the sink, and with a <laughs> diverter that you can flip one way to just use washing water and another way to send water into the machine, and then it comes out the stainless steel. And here's the front side of another one, and you see the pre-filters that I'm using, an ultra-water filter, which is carbon granules, carbon blocks, silver impregnated, a fluoride shield special to remove fluoride, and the water's um, hooked up, but you can't see all the hookup, and finally coming out, the alkaline fraction coming out of this stainless steel spigot. In this case, the acid water is going down the drain, but I have collected it for plants and experiments and sanitation. Well, of course, there are, just like soil labs, there are water labs, okay. plenty of those. <laughs> Here's another way to get ionized water, but not nearly as strong. There are pitchers, they're called non-electric ionizers, that have mineral rocks in them, and you pour pre-filtered water. This does not have those great filters, but you need uh, the filters. And then you pour this through this bunch of rocks on the interior of this, and out here you get somewhat mineralized, uh, more mineralized and slightly negative ORP, but not minus 200 millivolts. So from the non-electric ionizer, you're not going to get very strong water, but you will get an improvement. So those are much cheaper. The electric ionizers uh, cost in the order of $1,500 and up. Part of it is the platinum electrode, some of it is the 
dollar exchange rate with foreign currency and um, and there are multi-level marketing firms out there selling them for four thousand dollars so beware so here are my conclusions and how we're we doing almost so <clears throat> So ionized alkaline water is a structured functional water that scavenges reactive oxygen species, uh, diminishes systemic inflammation, the chronic inflammation, the kind we want to dispel, and is a useful adjunct for treating reactive oxygen species associated conditions such as chronic diseases, from uh, kidney disease to uh, cancer and uh, diabetes, as I've shown here. It reduces red blood cell aggregates and fibrin, as I've shown at least in one case, but I've seen numerous cases, the data I didn't show you here, but that is certainly the case. And I've been drinking this water for 20 years. My blood looks like I'm 20 and I'm pushing 70. So um, it may slow down the effects of aging. It has energetic properties comparable to natural mountain streams and water imbued with love. And ionized acidic water has antiseptic properties and some usefulness in agriculture that is just beginning to be explored in papers in recent years as foliar sprays as well as germination uh, waters. And finally, we can make these waters in our own homes using commercial devices. So I have some publications. You can go to my websites and get some of these, not all of them, because some are copyrighted and I can't show them. But this list is on my websites, and here is my websites, frontiersciences.org and brubic.com. I also have some handouts out here, and if we ran out of them, I have cards. Let me say this, my, my nonprofit laboratory is a distributor for some of these water systems, so if you're interested, uh, then you can get in touch with me later. Thank you. And I'll be here at three something. And I've got some fireside chat later today, so I look forward to seeing you. I'll show you the blood of people drinking soda pop, how that looks. <laughs> <laughs>